let's welcome Professor Dennis Long. Well, since two speakers have already mentioned him, I have to comment on those two voices from Oxford interviews of our famous uh, Balliol comedian. <laughs> um, for those who don't know what that refers to, that is indeed Boris Johnson. I tell you, he's a fantastic comedian. And he responded in the way you might expect a good stage comedian to do to the opening remark I made to him. You're not a very gentle person, are you? <laughs> he groaned. And as the groan turned into a triumphant attitude on the part of a politician, he said, that's right, I know what I am doing. I just mentioned that because that's not what I'm going to talk about, but I am going to talk about um, a, a very different situation in which somebody is in a, a hot seat. Um, but I mention it in order to uh, say that the speech from Paul, my goodness, I think, Paul, you've got a new job coming <laughs> to go out and tell the world that we know where we're going and we know what to do to get out of uh, big holes. But now I come to the real point of my talk. The person I'm going to talk about is in a very deep hole indeed and it's my job to get him out of it because I want you to imagine that this is a courtroom and the judge is sitting somewhere over there and my client, the defendant, somewhere over there and the charge is about the worst it can be. Murder. Premeditated. So, like any good lawyer, I've had my discussions with my client, and he's asked me to present his defence, which is not to challenge any of the facts whatsoever about the incontrovertible evidence that he did what he did. But he's asked me nevertheless to say that his plea of not guilty is extremely well founded. How can that possibly be the case? Well, his defence is roughly as follows, Your Honour. You see, my client spent a lot of time when he was young reading voraciously, and one of the books that he read very carefully indeed was The Selfish Gene. And he seriously thinks, you see, that Richard was right. They, the funny things down here, you know, they're, they're the DNA in your cells, um, created this body and mind. And mind, well, don't let's worry too much about that because his defense is, in part, well, I am the product of my genes. But of course, my Lord, he's not so simple-minded as to think that that's all there is to it because he realises that between the genes and him doing whatever he did when he ended up killing somebody, um, there, were, there was at least his brain and all his trillions of neurons involved. And there he tells me, Your Honour, that he was reading a very famous paper by the American neuroscientist Benjamin Liebet, who in 1982 published a very classic study. He was recording the activity from the surface of the skull of the brain while subjects were asked to say exactly when, as they pressed a button, at a time of their choosing, exactly what the time was when they pressed the button and decided to press the button. And you remember I said he was also recording from the brain. And he came up with a very interesting observation indeed. The brain fires before the subject recognises that he has made the decision to press the button. This is an extremely famous experiment and it's been used uh, by many people to argue that it 
therefore must be the case that you are not in control. Your brain determines what you do. And my client, Your Honour, thinks that that is his defence. It's very clear. As I said, he doesn't challenge any of the facts about the case. He just simply says, it wasn't me. Now, I'm going to take off my lawyer's hat in a moment. I'm going to switch uh, to being a psychiatrist in just a moment. But while I'm just Dennis Noble, I want to make a comment on this particular defence. You all know as I know that that defence would never work in a court of law in this country or indeed in any other country in the world. Now why is that the case? The two kinds of answer to that, one would be, well, if all of that is correct, and if we allowed that as a defence, society would fall apart. There would be no law. Because that defence could be used by anybody, charged with absolutely anything. But of course, that's not the best way to tackle the problem. Because that would be to say that we've got to live with a very strange mixture. That on the one hand, we've got to say that that kind of defence cannot be used, cannot be allowed in a court of law. But on the other hand, we recognise that nevertheless, he was right to think as he was thinking. Well, it leads me to the second point. Of course, he wasn't bright to think in the way he was thinking. Because that view has as its origin an idea in science and in philosophy that was very common indeed in the 19th century. It was encapsulated most famously by the great French mathematician Laplace, who is the person who made the point that if everything was Newtonian mechanics, like atoms like billiard balls running into each other, then if you solve the differential equations for all of those movements, you'd be able to predict the whole of the future, and indeed know what Drum and Bone is going to say later tonight, or I'm going to say in ten years' time, if I'm still here, and so on and so forth. And, of course, uh, retrodict all the way back to the past. It would be absolutely determined. He put it in very clear terms, actually. He said a superintelligence would know everything and would be able to predict exactly what was going to happen and exactly what has happened. Now, two things destroyed that view of science and the universe at the beginning of the last century, and they were relativity and quantum mechanics. I won't spend too much time on the relativity side because it gets extremely complicated, but I will just focus for a moment on the quantum mechanics. What does it mean? That at a very fundamental level, the universe is not determinate. We have no idea, as physiologists, which is what I am, whether or not that matters in relation to brain function, but what we do know in relation to gene function and in relation to brain function is that there is massive randomness and stochasticity. Now it takes a long book, well not such a long book, but quite a book, um, to lay out the reasons why that is important. Um, so he has already referred to it, Dance to the Tune of Life. But I want just to say this about it so that we can return to our poor defendant. It is very simply this, that once you allow Charles to come in, there was a very nice comment that Sir Drummond made about some parts of his life being semi-accident. And I like that because, you know, we all live on the edge of things that could go that way or could go this way. Now, I know, as you do, that there are philosophers and many scientists who say, but actually it's perfectly possible if we knew enough you'd be able to say which direction you're going to go. I doubt that. But let's return just for a moment, and in closing my few remarks, to our poor defendant, because he's now already in prison, of course, and I've become his prison psychiatrist, and I'm working out with him what is his real problem here, and he tells me, well, you know, it's terribly depressing, isn't it? 
to be told by scientists and philosophers that really you're not in control, that, you know, okay, my case didn't work, your defence wasn't good enough, it didn't pass, and here I am in prison, um, but to be frank, I was very depressed before that. Now, let me tell you just uh, as an interesting fact, I was present a year or so ago at a meeting in Holland, um, the big gathering of people to discuss uh, the launch of the Dutch translation of my little book, The Music of Life. And the philosopher who introduced the session told the story of a very famous uh, Dutch novelist who, before he shot himself, explained why. He was totally convinced of what my defendant, and now my patient, uh, was convinced of. That is, that he really did not have any control. It can be a very depressing view. And my advice is this. Science is very, very complicated. When you hear people say, you know, with great certainty that they know about how genes behave in our bodies, how our neurons behave in our bodies, and will tell you that in goodness knows how many years' time you'll find that we'll be able to predict what you're going to do. Don't take them so seriously. Think carefully about what you feel as a person when you're reacting in situations in which you can go this way or that way. My message, you are in control, is not to say that you are entirely in control, that would clearly also not be true. But if it were not the case that you were in control at all, I don't think we would be living in the world that we know. Thank you very much.